you are tuned in to the State of Cannabis News Hour, where industry leaders, regulators, and lovers of cannabis gather collectively to move policy forward in an inclusive and sustainable way. Professionals and Canacurious alike can tune in to hear leading cannabis experts share and discuss headlines, critical industry issues, social topics, and more. The State of Cannabis News Hour, your daily dose. Hi, and welcome to the State of Cannabis News Hour, where we bring you all the top stories you need to know and talk about them for four minutes and 20 seconds. We are a group of experts in different cannabis spaces with a wide diversity of perspectives and life experiences. Our news is bite-sized and infused with a nice mix of facts, opinions, and a pinch of humor. It's Tuesday, April 12th, 2022. This is episode number 256. I'm Susan Sorries, the founder of the State of Cannabis News Hour, author of the children's book, What's Growing in Grandma's Garden, and Cannabis's Favorite Grandma, aka Nanogram. If you're listening to the podcast or watching on the YouTube channel, the show is live every weekday at 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time on Clubhouse. Spark it up with us and over 29,000 State of Cannabis News Hour members if you want to be an audience participant. Otherwise, please subscribe to support our show. We'd love to hear from you, so please leave us a review. Today, we're talking about the amount of money the industry could bring to the table if it was federally legal, a retailer giving out gas cards to customers, safe banking, a new psychometric assessment of cannabis intoxication, a 15-year-old wanted for murder in a pot shop robbery, is the Green Street Festival the fire festival of weed? Is it even possible to determine a cannabis dose? And many other frosty nuggets. So stay tuned for the full 60 minutes of the State of Cannabis News Hour. The following program contains coarse language and nudity. Viewer discretion is advised. Audience, feel free to raise your hands if you want to weigh in on a headline after it's been read, and we'll try to bring you up to the stage. Keep it brief and relevant, or you might get the gong. Kicking off the show today is Rico Lamite. He likes to ask the tough questions that the mainstream media refuses to ask. The self-proclaimed dopest dad alive is here to encourage other dope dads. Find him on TEDx or at one of his Cannavision events, but always find him here every weekday as co-producer of the State of Cannabis News Hour. What you got today, Rico? All right. Happy Taco Tuesday, everybody. It's time to talk about some real shit. My story is coming from Maureen Meehan over at Benzinga. Cannabis is bringing in billions of dollars. Imagine if it was federally legal. Follow the money. 99% of Earth's problems can be traced back to some sort of exchange currency for better or worse products and services, whether we like it or not. One could even argue it that... Uh, argue that point going back to the beginning of modern civilization. I often do, and I haven't taken an L yet. It's the inevitable byproduct of a global capitalist society we choose to live in. But if it's all about the money, why isn't cannabis legal yet? More importantly, what's going on in the U.S.? I mean, we started the conversation, so let's look at the numbers. Legal Weed's on track to eclipse $33 billion in sales revenue this year. MJ Biz fact, but estimates will hit $52 billion by 2026. The fact book editor, Janelle Stelton Holtmeyer, is quoted in this article saying, while federal legalization flounders in Washington, D.C., the American cannabis industry's economic impact could near $100 billion by end of 2022 and nearly $158 billion by 2026. This means that for every $1 consumers and patients spend at adult use stores and dispensaries, an additional $1.80 will be injected into the economy, much of it on a local level. You heard that right. Cannabis's total U.S. economic impact in 2022 is expected to hit at least $99 billion this year, 20% higher than last year, and they're calling for 155 mil, excuse me, $155 billion by 2026. But what about jobs? Currently, the industry is responsible for about 520,000 jobs, and Benzinga notes that number will pass 800,000 by 2026. Remember, cannabis taps into agriculture, manufacturing, retail, events, and hospitality, the last two having a much broader impact than other industries. And taxes, Maureen points out, uh, hundreds of millions of tax dollars are doled out each year by businesses, consumers, and patients used to fund government activities and support schools and road projects as well. 
We've even reported on the State of Cannabis News Hour on real data correlations between real estate and neighborhood value spikes and new retail manufacturing and agricultural licenses opening up from state to state. So what gives? My personal opinion is the lack of courage by our lawmakers to do the right thing and make good on their promises to right the past wrongs of the racist and illegal war on drugs. They underestimated the personal nature of this industry driven from generational harm done to underserved communities. Their fight for support and a seat at the table next to deep-pocketed peers who couldn't tell you how many grams are even in an eighth. It's too much of a political tinderbox currently, and the lawmakers and big corporations have enough money to play the marathon game. Many of us do not. But those are just my thoughts. This is Rico Lamit, the dopest dad on the street for the State of Cannabis News Hour. I'd love to hear what the most diverse news team in cannabis media has got to say on this. What say you, Jason and Susan? I say cha-ching. I mean, you always say, Rico, follow the money, and there's a whole lot of money to follow in this story. Yes, there is, man. And, and people need to get off their feelings. If, if people get out of their feelings, that this thing will be legalized tomorrow. You, but it's it, it's just way too personal of an industry, though. That's my that's my. It's thoughts. just like the dollar sign has people, been the carrot all along from California on. So do you think this carrot is going to be big enough for feds? I think our mouths are going to be a little too small by the time the carrot comes to the plate. I think we need to emphasize that uh, because I think a lot of Republican lawmakers still believe in the gateway theory, and we need to emphasize that that ain't the truth. Cannabis is not the gateway drug. It's a gateway to a healthier lifestyle. It's a gateway to the refrigerator. Come on, get it right. Gateway to my okay. Uh, let's keep moving because we've got so much news today. Up next is co-producer Jason Beck. His prov- provocative spin keeps the show popping. He has proven to be one of the most resilient players in the weed game since starting his first store in San Francisco. What's your headline today, Jason? Oh, yeah. Good morning. Thank you so much, Susan. And today, my story has to do with my whole campaign slogan which is buy better gas. In Joe Biden's America, we have extremely high gas prices. And thank goodness there's some cannabis retailers to give gas cards to customers. That's right. If you live in Michigan or you are a Michigander, two Michigan cannabis companies are teaming up to give away $70,000 in gas cards for customers. Jars Cannabis, a Michigan retailer of medical and adult use cannabis products, is partnering with Hyman, a luxury lifestyle cannabis brand, For its Gas Up With Us campaign, starting April 12th, Jars will be giving away $25 Speedway gas gift cards to customers who fish in Jars, uh, Jars of the high bones in eighth while supplies last. The Jars are in 12 retail stores across Michigan and following recent national gas price hikes by the Biden administration, Jars enlisted Hyman to relaunch the Indica hybrid strain for the Gas Up With Us campaign under the special edition product drop. Supporting the communities we inhabit and serve is is at the core of our brand's DNA, said Jars Cannabis Marketing Director Stephanie Michaels. We're always striving to find creative ways to give back to our communities and loyal customers, so we want to thank Hyman for teaming up with us during this time of need. The Bozeman Cannabis Strains launched in Michigan in 2021 under Hyman Series 2 collection. Its names come from a rough translation of the word gasoline in several different languages and serves as an ode to the melting pot of cultures throughout Michigan. The Bonzine Cannabis Flower will be available for purchase in eighth collectible jars and containers. And I'll tell you what, and you get a free gas card. So gas it up buy better gas, support these types of companies. This is fantastic news. Thank you so much. This is Jason Beck reporting for the State of Cannabis News Hour. Very interesting name of that cannabis. Yeah, it's gas in another language. Hymen is? Yeah, I'm like, what are their strains? Like, to say this, like, purple pussy print or something? I mean, that's kind of a name. I guess it's attention-grabbing and sparks conversation. I mean, I had a strain back in the day that was called Sweet Pussy. It just sold like hotcakes. Even the old ladies would come and buy it. (laughs) <laughs> what the fuck dude watch it on the old ladies jason they were older than me oh dear all right should we keep rocking the news or anybody else want to talk about i think, it's a, great, I think it's a great idea and uh, uh for a promotion for cannabis companies and if you got that money to give out then go ahead and do it get more people in your shop i i don't know about the collectible jars seems like a stretch 
People need to stop throwing out their jars. Well, I mean, but what do you do with them? You have to or, say that they're... That I give them credit for hitting a pain point that's hitting people. So, I mean, I guess connect the gas to gas. I guess connect the pain point to the hymen. This all goes back with my campaign of buy better gas. You were on it, Jason. You did it first. You said yes, it first. Indeed. So coming to the stage next is a true California Renaissance woman. She brings the damn data, not the damn drama. An educator, brand strategist, healthcare consultant, founder of the Cannabis Business Council of Santa Barbara County. Come to the stage. It's Liz Rogan. What you got for us today? Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Rico, or good day, everyone. Um, thanks for joining us. My story comes from the Psych Post by Eric Dolan. The headline reads, psychologists have developed a new psychometric assessment of cannabis intoxication. So this article highlights a newly released study entitled Assessing Subjective Cannabis Effects in Daily Life with Contemporary Youth Adult Language, authored by uh, Rene Cloutier et al. So it was published in the January 22nd edition, sorry, January 2022 edition of the peer-reviewed journal of drug and alcohol dependence. So the study itself focuses in trying to understand the level of intoxication of cannabis by looking at certain anchor words. They say that perceptions of drug effects, uh, quote, may guide risky decision-making, understanding subjective feelings for alcohol and marijuana use is critical. So they're saying existing lab-based metrics that they'd used of like a zero to 100 rating of how drunk or how high do you feel may be problematic in differentiating labels of subjective effects. So they're trying to look at using language to better capture feelings so they can use this for, you know, more designs to help um, kind of I get this all, like put all this data together, not only to help understand what people are feeling, but to put this together to provide for the industry for more data total. So the thing is they're basing this on previous research by one of the study's co-authors. And so the premise is based on the theory that that one to zero to 100 scale of intoxication is not as effective as if they use anchor words, specifically for cannabis, which were relaxed, comma, uh, calm slash chill, high, and stone slash baked. And they did do the previous research on both alcohol and cannabis, and it's mainly focused on college age contingent, which is 18 to 23. They looked at 161 adults for two weeks. Every day they asked them if they'd used cannabis the day before, how they used it, like a bong, vape, pipe, edible, et cetera, and to rate the subjective intoxication using both the older scale, so the zero to 100, and the newly developed scale of those anchor words, So the thing is, this is um, the research itself, like they're kind of saying, oh, this really, this is great. This might be a way to look at this in the future. Um, They really didn't come up with any really strong conclusions, just that, oh, more research needs to be done. And so I looked a little deeper into it. And, you know, if you look at what these people are researching, the other authors, um, they're just, they're kind of looking at um, this drug and alcohol dependence a lot. So that's like their real focus. And then honestly, as a cannabis user for for years, I, and working with patients and in the industry, I just don't really think that those words are actually in any way indicative of how people feel. And that's something that you could use to actually assess what their level of quote intoxication was. So this is Liz Rogan. I'm reporting for the State of Cannabis News Hour, and I'd love to hear what you guys have to say about this. Should this be uh, labeled under fake news? Well, you know, you know what I was going to say, Rico. I was going to say, you know, pre people can just go and go fuck their feelings. We need to be more logic based going forward. It sounds to me like people are still trying to figure out exactly how to describe cannabis, and I mean, I feel like a lot of the big MSOs and people that just want to take this whole flower, this, you know, this God-given plant and turn it into CBD and THC ratios and terpene profiles, uh, you know, don't want to talk about indica or sativa and they don't want to talk about if it makes you feel calm or baked or super stoned or locked in the couch. I mean, I feel like a lot of these terms are really important and valuable for people, a cerebral buzz versus a body buzz. And not only medicinally, but also for what you're trying to go for recreationally. I mean, if you just want to Netflix and chill, you need a different bud than if you want to uh, hit the streets. That's all based on the terpene profile, Dr. And Mary. And the minor cannabinoids and the THC and CBD ratios. There's, I, I, and I mean, I really think it's strain-based, Jason. I don't think it can be reduced to terpene profiles. Terpene profiles are strain-based. 
Well, yeah, but so are the minor cannabinoids and the major cannabinoids and probably the flavonoids, a, a lot of things. I think you bring up a great point, um, Mary, and I think that that's the problem, that with trying to generalize this is so like subjective to the person and how they feel and how much they have used and how they may have used it versus edible versus other things. It was interesting, they said they found like the highest correlation with vapes. And the thing is this, it's like, it reminds me of a company that I'm sure you're all aware of that came out early in the industry in California and tried to label their strains by feelings. I personally was really offended by that in the beginning um, as a biologist, because cultivars are really important and have a lot of these important benefits and just kind of categorizing them into this feeling, I think is doing them an enormous disservice. I agree with well, that, you, Liz, the one, totally. The, the one thing about that one brand, though, Liz, that you're, that you're referring to is they weren't using strain-specific. So for whatever feeling, there would be like five or six different strains that they would use for that one in particular feeling. So it was never based off the same strain. It's a good point. The brand that shall, re, re, shall remain nameless. I posted a, a link um, that I think it's important that we read. I, d I wanted to cover it, but it's a little bit old. Uh, it's in LA Weekly, a cannabis manifesto. It's time to retire the words indica and sativa from cannabis culture. Please read that. But let's keep smoking the news. All right. Thank you so much. Coming up next, this badass cannabis mom is the co-founder of the International Cannabis Bar Association, current chair of the Bar Association of San Francisco Cannabis Law Section, and founder of the San Francisco Equity Applicant Pro Bono Legal Project and the organic source of the silkiest, smoothest vocal cords on Clubhouse. What do you have this morning for us, Laura? Oh, thanks so much, Jason. I love that intro. Um, this morning, I just have a little congratulatory piece for our homegrown girl here in San Francisco, Nicole Elliott. It is entitled, California Confirms New Director for the Department of Cannabis Control. It's by Zach Mentz for the Cannabis Business Times. So the California State Senate confirmed Nicole Elliott as the Director of the Department of Cannabis Control, RDCC, by unanimous vote. 34 to zilch. On March 30th, she absolutely rocked that state confirmation hearing. She was originally appointed, you may recall, by uh, Governor Newsom on July 13th, 2021, as the DCC's first director. Uh, there's a quote from her co worker from day one Nicole Elliott, Director Elliott, excuse me, hit the ground running responsibly leading the newly created Department of Cannabis Control, building a strong organizational culture and team, and creating meaningful stakeholder engagement opportunities, said Lord, Lourdes, I'm sorry, Castro Ramirez, Secretary of California's Business Consumer Services and Housing Agency. Um, you know, a little bit of history about Nikki. She was raised in the Auburn area, educated at the University of San Francisco. She got her start at San Francisco City Hall in 2009, interning at then Mayor Newsom's office while well, actually also bartending. Um, but she attributes much of her skills to her leadership um, with San Francisco Mayor Ed Lee, who died suddenly, you may recall, in 2017. Prior to her current position, she had served as the governor's senior advisor on cannabis, a.k.a. our cannabis czar. This was prior to department consolidation. Um, and before that, she held multiple roles in the city and county of San Francisco under both Mayor Newsom and um, Mayor Lee. So I just wanted to congratulate her on this um, amazing milestone. She's not even 40. She's an amazing person. I think she's done a great job. Um, and she's, she's not responsible for our taxes, just like Joe Biden's not responsible for our gas prices. Uh, so I just wanted to give a shout out to Nikki Elliott and say congratulations. This is Laura DeCaro reporting for the State of Cannabis News Hour. Hey, Laura, quick question for you. How is this different from when Lori Abrams was there? I think it was Lori, Lori Abrams. Um, Ajax. Apex, Ajax. yes. Ajax. Yeah. Yeah. She was Ajax. a Ajax. Um, um, how is this uh, I'm, I don't know that it is different. I believe that all directorships require um, Senate confirmation. Um, but, you know, I mean, but Lori was, remember, a director of a sub agency. This is actually a department. So that was kind of part of the problem, right? When we had the prior structures that they, um, the, the, the department that she headed was actually a sub department. It wasn't a real department. We had the Department of Public Health the um, Department of Food and Ag, um, and, and then the Consumer 
affairs agency, which was below that, which Lori actually housed. So that might have been that might have been part of the differentiation. Uh, the big difference for me, Roz, <laughs> is that um, Lori Ajax came, was the bureau chief for the uh, Alcohol and Beverage Control Board, and. The, you know, coming from that background, I was worried from the beginning that that's that was a mistake. And and uh, Nicole Elliott is coming from a much a better position from a regulatory environment. When I met I first met Lori Ajax, I accidentally met her. I I went into the room before it was time, I guess, and um, she had, she was appointed like three weeks earlier, and I. I went up to her and I said, hey, I'd really love to have you speak at my event. And she said, oh, well, things are really crazy right now. It's nuts. Uh, but give me a month or two when things calm down and um, then we'll talk about it. And I just burst out and laughed. I was like, Lori, this isn't alcohol. This is cannabis. Things are not going to calm down. It's not going to ever calm down. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it was a bad start. Yeah, no, Nikki is amazing. She's just, just, just an, um, has an amazing wealth of knowledge about the industry, and she does like to sit down with her stakeholders. She would never have put you off like that for a couple months. She's always willing. If she can make it, she's willing to come. Yeah, I, think, I, I, I echo, you, you echo your sentiments, uh, Susan. I think that was uh, heard all throughout the California industry. Like people, like she came from big alcohol. She didn't come from the industry, and. Um, that's a lot. It's the same mistake a lot of other states are sadly making when they open up their industries. They're putting people that were in big business before, but they don't know the cannabis business, and you need to to be successful. Yeah, well, I know I she, she had a lot. She had a lot of different subs under her, like assistant chief this, assistant chief that. So it'd just be interesting. Are they going to have the same infrastructure, or is it different, or is this you know is um, Nicole Elliott, at one person, she a one woman shop, um, you know, because California, you need a lot of support. Yeah, no, she's got a lot of support. She's really building out um, a, an excellent department. Um, I've talked to her about that recently. They're hiring a number of lawyers right now. Uh, if anybody's out there looking for a job, check out their website. They are staffing. So she's definitely got an infrastructure. She will have support. Yeah, congratulations, Nicole Elliott. I wish you the best and hope. Hope that you can do the best for our industry because our des our industry desperately needs uh, some some true leadership up in Sacramento. Um, and I, I, in addition to that, uh, just I I'm really hope that she's not getting put in the position of being a scapegoat for ultimate failure. I agree. 100 percent. So we're at the end of the time for that story. Um, up next, she's a. Feisty redheaded conservative claiming to have Mayflower roots and never backing down from a challenge by pop loving liberals across the aisle. She's also the founder of Panoptic Strategies and our very own Washington Insider. Come to the stage, it's Gretchen Gailey. Happy Tuesday, Gretchen. What you got for us? Well, happy Tuesday, Rico. I don't claim to have Mayflower roots, it's verified. Uh, my uh, story front today comes from Marijuana Moment. It is marijuana banking push set to be revived as congressional leaders appoint negotiators on large-scale manufacturing bill. I would cue uh, Jason Beck here to say uh, passe thanking. Uh, passe thanking. With, with congressional leaders appointing key lawmakers to negotiate the final form of a broad manufacturing and innovation bill in recent days, many advocates and stakeholders are hopeful it will be the vehicle to finally enact protections for banks that work with state legal marijuana businesses as the House included its version of the large-scale legislation that now heading to a bicameral conference committee. There are signs that the bipartisan Safe Banking Act could be a focal point for negotiators with the chairwoman of the House Financial Services Committee on Monday listing the bill as one of her panel legislative priorities. Uh, the measure sponsor also emphasized that a strong majority of members appointed to the conference committee have already either co-sponsored or voted for marijuana banking legislation in the past. Representative Maxine Waters uh, didn't explicitly say how she would fight for the cannabis measure's inclusion in the final package in her capacity as a conferee, but she made a general comment about how Democrats have pushed for policies meant to maximize economic impact and said that cannabis banking reform would both support state markets and provide public safety protections. She said, cannabis businesses are currently forced to operate on a cash-only basis. 
which has created a serious public safety risk for employees, businesses, and communities, as well as providing opportunities for tax evasion and money laundering. Meanwhile, another conferee that uh, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi appointed last week is Representative Earl Blumauer, who has long fought to end prohibition comprehensively, but also has insisted that there's an urgent need to take the incremental step of enacting the Safe Banking Act. In an op-ed for Marijuana Moment that was published on Monday, Blumenauer described the banking reform measure as a huge step towards public safety and equity in the industry. Uh, Representative Earl Perlmutter, sponsor of Marijuana Banking Mill that passed this house in uh, some form six times now, was not selected as a conferee, but he's made it clear that he would pursue any vehicle to get his legislation passed before his retirement at the end of this session. And he sits on the key House Rules Committee that all legislation must go for before receiving a floor vote. Uh, He says, I appreciate the continued support of the Safe Banking Act in the House, including from Chairwoman Waters and my colleagues on the financial services community. Uh, I think this is a good thing that Maxine Waters is making it a priority. Uh, We shall see um, if good old Chuck uh, decides to uh, kick it out when it hits the Senate floor. Um, it's yet to be said. Um, but I think the interesting thing about this is a number of the conferees, um, and I've lost the number now, um, I would say more than two thirds of the conferees on the committee have voted for safe banking. Uh, so this is really going to come down to a pissing match with Chuck Schumer, um, on whether or not this ends up, uh, in the final version. Uh, this is Gretchen for State of Canvas News Hour. I think it's very interesting the way the conservatives rally around and are all nice about people when they support their bills. But when they ask for their help, they call them every name but the what was God given, what their parents gave them. What conservative what are Democrats you referring do. to? That's there, what right? Democrats do, Rico. You're tripping. And what conservative are you referring to, Rico? All of them. I, I can run through. I can do a quick Google search of all the things Maxine Waters has been called by every sitting member of Congress right now across the aisle, and none of it's good. Okay, well, no one I quoted in the story was a Republican. They're all Democrats, um, so I don't know who you. Talk about a you. Talk about you. You got some nice words to say about her. I'm just saying. I've never uh, slapped down Maxine Waters, but I'll bitch about Chuck Schumer all day and all night. It's the glasses that they really get to you. That they trigger you, huh? I love them. They're they're awesome. <laughs> they, they bring me in. I, I mean, really, the, this is all going to come down to Chuck Schumer again. Um, he continues to say that the CAOA is going to come out by the end of the month um, and that he doesn't want anything else to go forward before his is introduced. Grant. We'll see if he really signs off on this or not. I, I think it's going to be hard pressed to say no again for the second time. I agree. I think it's bullshit, Chuck. I agree with you. Pass safe banking already. I, I agree with you, Greg. <laughs> We shall and see. that was a fantastic story, Gretchen. Thank you so much, Rico. Great commentary as usual. Coming up next, he's an award-winning journalist with a multicultural background and fifth-generation Californian known as a freedom-fighting farmer's friend. The writer, brand consultant, event promoter, and content ninja does it all in the name of uncovering the international truce the lamestream media does not want you to see. What do you have this morning for Eric Kesslerita? Hey, Jason, thanks for that intro, and it's California. We're the folks that were here before the English speakers showed up. Um, Great to be here today. My headline is from High Times, and it's Hot Cannabis Seeds to Grow in 2022. Um, Maybe there's a few few like me who are fatigued by the news cycle, the latest DC drama, or somebody being busted for practicing bro science. So I thought it'd be nice, um, since it's the time of year when we traditionally get our gardens going. Um, so I thought this would be a cool little focus on the plant instead of the politics. I'm going to jump right in here with some edits for time. Luckily for us, cannabis was made illegal. After all, if the U.S. Had, government had not decided to criminalize cannabis, starting with a tax for growing it, we wouldn't have nearly as many different types. When cannabis growers and breeders were forced underground, they made Uh, They used male and female plants to create their own seed stock. The illegal distinction borne by the cannabis plant has led to it being one of the most diverse botanicals on the planet. When the war on drugs meant Americans could no longer get land-raised genetics like Acapulco gold from Mexico, we looked further toward Amsterdam's cannabis melting pot. The fusion of American cannabis enthusiasts and legends like Sam the Skunk Man and Ed Rosenthal with Dutch seed companies blessed the world with delicacies like Super Lemon Haze and provided the platform to promote them. Today, the worldwide cannabis seed uh, market is a thriving industry. 
Sir, uh, seed germination for outdoor growing starts in spring. Seeds require 10 to 15 days longer than clones. So the end of April is an excellent time to pop them to get the 2022 outdoor harvest outside by Mother's Day. <clears throat> we checked in with a couple ganja growing all-stars to see what cannabis combinations they're excited about this year. And I'm, for the sake of time, I'm just going to uh, use one of the interviews. Uh, David Downs, Senior Content Manager with Leafly. Uh, what seeds are you excited about for this planting season? So for this planting season, I'm super juiced to rerun Humboldt Seed Company Squirt. For year three, I can smoke that super optimized uh, modern tangy all day, every day, and it makes a great salad with other sativa during the night and or some gas at night. I'm also hyped to bring back Hum Seed Co.'s Hella Jelly for year two as a sativa that finishes early and has mad cherry and cotton candy taste and zippy daytime effects. And lastly, I'm pumped to run Terp Hogs Genetic Z3 for the first time this year. Terp Hogs is selling seed directs to your door on next level delivery in the Bay Area. And if you don't know how cool it is to shop, buy and get Terp Hogs uh, genes delivered in a couple of hours, and now you know, it's so clutch. Uh, next question was, do you typically grow from seed? If so, why? Yes, I like the vigor of seeds, especially regulars. They get huge outside. There's also less chances of a virus or pest uh, infection from seeds versus clones. I buy seeds all year, and they keep well until it's time to plant. Um, so what does your growth setup look like? I start popping indoors the first day of spring and raise the babies inside where it's warm, then sex the juveniles and harden them on the porch in the city before transplanting the keepers into 30-gallon fabric pot uh, pots outdoors in the NorCal sun by Mother's Day. We try and kiss, keep it simple, stupid. We use Fox Farm Ocean Forest soil plus amendments and well water and a drip and BT to fight the caterpillars. And there are certain types, uh, are there certain types of cannabis or specific cultivars that do well where you're growing? Um, yeah, I'm an outdoor NorCal Bay Area grower and I'm deliberately running Humboldt Seed Company, Archive and Terp Hogs because I think their gear tends to be tested and screened for outdoor runs. I know Hum Seed Co. does a bunch of mixed light testing, and Terp Hogs and Mendo also works in mixed light. Um, I want to run stuff that's been tested outside for sure. Lots of the latest crosses are bred and tested inside, and many breeders and growers don't know how they react to the variations in heat, humidity, etc. outside. I want stuff that's hard to fuck up as opposed to some diva that molds the second it rains or some crazy sativa that won't finish until November. But that's just me. Everyone, uh, everyone's needs are pretty specific. And I'm just going to add, I had one cool discovery I made this year. Uh, Huckleberry Hill Farms out of Humboldt came up with these cool uh, little peat pucks with one seed per. It's the easiest germination I've ever done. You pop the puck in a little water like an ashtray. And in a week or so, you have a seedling sitting in its own growing medium. And if you want to see a little demo, I put one on my company's IG feed a couple days ago. That's Greenlit TG on IG. And by the way, they won an Emerald Cup uh, award a few years back for innovation with these. And that's what I've got today. I'm Eric for the State of Cannabis News Hour. Gracias for having me up. Thank you so much, Eric. I, I can't wait to see what's going to happen to the seed market now that the DEA said that it is okay, a okay to sell cannabis seeds. I hope everyone grows at least one cannabis plant in their life if they're a cannabis consumer. You got, yeah. I mean, it's so critical. It's just a whole relationship with the plant. You get a whole other perspective. You can get your head out of some of this other crap and, and understand what it's really all about. It's not a widget. It's not Bitcoin. It's a plant. Susan, the event I was at this weekend, the, almost the entire focus was on seeds and selling seeds. And I met, um, you know, geneticists all the way from Hawaii. A uh, bunch of folks from California, Colorado, a bunch of people came all the way to Chicago uh, to really push uh, what they've been doing, their genetics. And, and it was amazing to see so many people there. And really, the folks who came to the show, uh, that's where they were focused. Everyone wanted to buy seeds. So you should be seeing some good stuff coming up in Chicago soon. Yeah, as another layer to that, Gretchen, one of the biggest issues right now is the IP that those seeds represent. So I'm involved in, in some of that work, and, and you'll see that there's... Um, a lot in that space about protection of IP and protecting a lot of the legacy folks who created who created those strains. I did see a number of folks there, Eric, who who were giving credit to where they got their genetics from. Not to oh no no I know you're not no no I'm not saying that I'm just saying that's a really interesting space that the IP and if credit doesn't really count. You know, it's sort of like people have to protect this stuff because. A lot of the bigger, like, MSO types are coming for these genetics that people have worked very hard to develop over the decades. 
Thanks for sharing this article, Eric. Uh, good to hear, or I guess, good to not hear words like uh, cake and gelato and that you're talking about land race strains and things like that coming back because it's good to have genetic diversity. Um, and that genetic diversity and land race strains coming back does help breed new IP. Exactly why everyone should be focused on buying better gas. Hey, Brandon, what about Skittles? I'm he's so right, glad no right, more he's, runs. He's, he mentioned Skittles. He said the RS3. That's Skittles. Like no yeah. more Z3, sweet yeah. stuff. Z3. No more sweet stuff for a second. But this was a great story, Eric. Thank you. And Gretchen, I really appreciate hearing your insight on it. I do want to remind us, like from because I did that story the other day on seeds, that it actually goes back to the source rule. So it's basically what your intent is with that seed. So it'll be interesting to see how that goes. And I really hope that these breeders can maintain their IP and that value because they can give them credit like kudos. But without having that value, these people have done so much work. Well, I guess, I guess since you say the intent, I guess everyone should grow outdoor weed because they may, anyone that grows outdoor weed should be growing for their fireplaces during the winter so they could have a terpy holiday experience. Okay. We're going to quickly relight the room. We're, we are over time. You are tuned in to the State of Cannabis News Hour, your daily dose. The thoughts and opinions expressed in the State of Cannabis News Hour are those of the individual speakers, not those of any other speaker, the State of Cannabis, or its members. The statements made in the State of Cannabis News Hour do not constitute legal or accounting advice, and the State of Cannabis and its speakers make no representation regarding the legal status of any substance in any country, area, or territory, or any other authorities. The views expressed in this room do not establish any fiduciary relationships. The sponsorship of the State of Cannabis News Hour do not imply or constitute any endorsement by the State of Cannabis or the expressions of any of the opinions whatsoever on the part of the State of Cannabis or any of its speakers. Viewer discretion advised. Let's keep smoking the news. All right. Now, this former NorCal cop sacrificed his shield to increase our chances of survivability. This dope dad and cannabis security consultant for CC Security Solutions chose a road seldom traveled by fellow boys in blue by putting down his gun in a badge and picking up a blunt in a notepad. Up next, Chris Eggers. What you got for us today, my man? Good morning. Good morning, Rico and everybody. Happy Tuesday. Um, My article today comes out of uh, Washington State. And unfortunately, uh, the headline reads that a 15-year-old wanted for an alleged involvement in deadly Tacoma pot shop robbery was arrested. Uh, a 16-year-old accomplice remains at large and is considered to be armed and dangerous. This is coming out of Tacoma, Washington. A 15-year-old is considered the prime shooting suspect and robbery suspect in Tacoma um, Cannabis Dispensary Store. We was arrested by, uh, in Kent by Seattle Police on Monday. Um, the alleged suspect was arrested outside of the Regional Justice Center and booked into Juvenile Hall. Pierce County Prosecutor's Office told King 5 News that they are seeking a charge uh, to charge the teenager as an adult when he makes his first court appearance. Meanwhile, a 16-year-old remains at large and is considered armed and dangerous for his involvement in a March 19th incident at World of Weed Cannabis Dispensary. According to charging documents, the suspect got into a physical altercation with a Jordan Brown, an employee at the cannabis dispensary. Mr. Brown was allegedly shot by the 15-year-old accomplice and unfortunately passed away due to the injuries. Uh, On Monday, again, the 15-year-old was arrested. The 16-year-old is still wanted. Uh, But both teams were previously arrested and charged in connection with a robbery at a pawn shop back in February. And they are also suspects in a robbery at Bellevue Rare Coins in West Seattle. Um, The incident at World of Weed was the third fatal shooting connection to a cannabis dispensary robbery within one week in the Seattle area. Um, A suspect in that cannabis robbery in Bellevue and a suspect in cannabis in Covington were both killed earlier in the week. Um, Dozens of cannabis dispensaries have been robbed in western Washington over the last several months, uh, continuing to gain media attention. And although this is uh, unfortunate, I wanted to share with everybody because, um, again, a lot, lot of media coverage and a lot of increasingly violent robberies are occurring in the Seattle area uh, and other parts of the country as well, L.A., Oakland, the Bay Area, uh, and other parts, Denver as well. So I wanted to share this article. Um, curious what uh, folks think about this, specifically charging these uh, um, juveniles as adults. My name is Chris Eggers, and I'm reporting for the State of Cannabis News Hour. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Did they give any more information as to why they believe they should be charged as adults? Not according to this article. Uh, and, and also, I, I personally left her names out. I, I don't like to, to name um, the, the names of folks that are not convicted yet. But the article named um, both of these uh, juveniles, which is apparently how they got their arrest records and, and linked them to the February um Robbery, but did not include in this article of why they wanted to go after charging them as an adult. 
if if they're if they're named publicly as juveniles, can the parents or any guardians go back and sue those people for outing them like that? Because they could be ruining the rest of their lives if they ever get off of this. You know, I don't know specifically. I think the Laura may know, but but the rules I believe vary from state to state as far as um, naming juveniles. In in California, media outlets typically tend to um, steer away from that, and law enforcement agencies typically don't release the names of juveniles. So it may it may be different in Washington State, though. Let's keep smoking the news. All right. Well, coming up next, we ha- she's an attorney at law focused on bridging the gap between cannabis entertainment and psychedelics. She's also the co-owner of one of the flyest IG pages on the team and the other owner being Mark Zuckerberg. Coming to the stage next is the founder of Cannabis Blog and Podcast, Shall We Tope. What do you have for us this morning, Shalina? Thank you so much, Jason. Good morning, everyone. My name is Shalina, and my headline for today is UK says to CBD companies, are you on the list? Last week, the Food Standards Agency, the FSA, in the UK released a public list of approved CBD products. The FSA has a novel food process where any new products not traditionally sold or consumed in the UK must go through an extensive process to be approved. CBD products are no different. The FSA has stated on their website that those which are not on the list should be removed from sale because it is not attached to a credible application to us for market authorization. They further state that being on the list means that the application is credible and that the FSA has or is shortly expecting to receive significant evidence from the applicant with which to judge safety. The FSA emphasizes that they are not endorsing these products on the list as there is no guarantee they will be fully authorized since they haven't been fully assessed for safety as of yet. However, those who have been approved on the list will now move on to the full risk assessment. If they show they are low enough of a risk, then they will go through a risk management process before a recommendation can be made to ministers on authorization. CBD products which are not on the list must be taken off of shelves immediately at any stores they are currently selling in. The process was rigorous as it took two years of work between the FSA and the CBD sector of UK's Association of the Cannabinoid Industry, which is also known as ACI. According to their website, ACI is a membership organization for businesses committed to nurturing a safe, legal, and flourishing consumer cannabis extract market in the UK and Europe. On behalf of its members, ACI submitted a large file to the FSA in February 2021. Founder of ACI, Steve Moore, states that all members of the ACI have been included on the FSA's public list. As a result, they have earned the right to continue selling in the UK. The new rules are being enforced immediately by the trading standards. As such, all retailers that are currently selling CBD must check to see if these CBD products are compliant. This includes pharmacies, health food shops, cafes, convenience stores, supermarkets, and restaurants. ACI states that although some businesses don't comply, they should contact the ACI to see what their next steps are as the CBD market will continue to thrive in the UK. According to Celeb Stoner, David Beckham had invested $338,000 in the CBD company Cellular Goods in 2021 for five percent of the company his shares are now worth 1.3 million daily mail have reported that cellular goods was however not on the list but that their supplier chanel mccoy health cmh has met the rules further on investigate investigate.co.uk the company specifically states that cellular goods was not on the list but that this but that this is not necessary in order for the products to remain on the market they state that this is not a new product to market and that all FSA required details are clearly stated on their labeling. They go on to state that they welcome the introduction of stricter measures to improve consumer safety concerning novel foods and look forward to working closely with the FSA to ensure compliance with any new rules. What are your thoughts on how the UK is regulating their CBD market? My name is Shalina and I'm reporting for the State of Cannabis News Hour. So um, CBD out in the UK, they got a list for these motherfuckers, they, 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 you're gonna be marks now. These are these these are the approved approved vendor list of people that are allowed to sell CBD. That's correct, right? So you got to kiss the ring. Yeah, it's just like CBD being compliant. I mean, it seems like they're really forward in this. I don't know. I'm torn. I'm torn. I think they should just do the do it across the board for THC and CBD and, and start allowing kids out in the UK to actually get their medicine when they need it. How about that? What's the difference between applying for a license and being on a list, Rico? I mean, you get a license and you're protected. You're on. You're, you're on. You're, you're on a list. You're on a list when you get a license. Well, it's the same thing. Well, I mean, to that to Rico's point, though, what they're doing is establishing that they can actually regulate a cannabinoid, and they are choosing only to go with this. You know, the the hip CBD. Um, celebrity sort of branding concept as opposed to addressing 
a very desperate need of, you know, of children in the UK that we've been covering on a regular basis. I think that Rico's point is poignant. They do have some sort of um, regulation for medical where, and don't quote me on this, but it's like a THCCB ratio. And I, and there is something where they allow that, but it's obviously, you know, very highly regulated. UK, 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 they got some work to do. So up next, repping the longest of all South Bay, LA beaches, this CEO of the deliciously vegan edible brand Fruit Slabs and cannabis and intellectual property attorneys got a beard that's not only rooted in hair, but also vibes. Up next, Brandon Dorsky. What you got for us, my man? Uh, I've got some hot gossip. Uh, Coming from the New York Post and later corroborated by Page Six, the headline was Weed Festival Up in Smoke? Question mark. The article was about Green Street's failure to secure a permit for their anticipated Green Street Festival taking place in Los Angeles on May 13th and 14th and posed the question, could Green Street Festival be shaping up to be the fire festival of cannabis? The Green Street event was supposed to be a two-day extravaganza kicking off at Green Street's campus with a limited capacity event on Friday that featured Harry Mack and Gary V, and then have an outdoor larger festival for a bigger audience with music performances by Juicy J and more, a collection of food trucks including Uncle Paulie's Deli and Yeasty Boy's Bagels, and permitted cannabis consumption. The premier awards of cannabis culture, the Emerald Cup, were slated to take place at the event as well, but there has been an apparent divorce with them and Green Street over this permit debacle. The city of Los Angeles did not issue a necessary permit, and now Green Street is trying to move the event elsewhere while maintaining it as a cannabis culture festival. Uh, Emerald Cup cut ties over the permit failure with Rama Mayo, Josh Shelton, and the rest of the team at Green Street, and moved their event to the Montalban Theater. Emerald Cup, who had held the private event in L.A. last April, had seemingly brought their award show to the Green Street Festival to be public again, after being unable to secure a permit themselves for the event in L.A. this year. Green Street heavily promoted Emerald Cup's affiliation before recently scrubbing Emerald Cup's presence from the festival's social media pages and website. Green Street has still not made an official announcement that Emerald Cup is not part of the festival. A January press release, which included Emerald Cup, promised Green Street Festival would, quote, feature the city's top restaurants, the state's leading cannabis brands, and the world's top entertainers all brought together to celebrate the cannabis community. But it's, quote, a big shit show after months of hype, an anonymous source told Page Six, whom also suggested that they may have to refund tickets. The anonymous source noted Green Street Festival was, quote, selling tickets and sponsorships for an event without an actual venue, which may have ignited these fire festival comparisons. The anonymous source also suggested that due to the failure to obtain the permit, attendees, quote, won't be able to consume or sell, so in essence it would just be a showcase of weed that no one can buy or smoke. Green Street President Rama Mayo said, quote, the city changed their mind on letting us use their park and noted that there was always the possibility of this happening, which is why Green Street had never announced a venue. He also noted that Green Street reverted back to their original plan and that no tickets will need to be refunded. After the stories were reported, Blacklist picked it up and their active comment thread revealed even more unverified details of this developing story. So get your popcorn and go to at the Blacklist XYZ if you want to read what the culture is saying and what is being dug up about this separation. This is Brandon Dorsky reporting for the State of Cannabis News. I don't know if I necessarily would call the Blacklist XYZ the culture. I'd call it a bunch of trolls, not necessarily the culture. Definitely the drama. They definitely bring the drama uh, and the rumors. <laughs> I mean, you know, I guess. <laughs> like the look, blacklist is uh, they're like the TMZ of the of the industry. <laughs> yeah, the TMZ for sure. Yeah. So, um, but I will say that the Green Street Festival is still going to go on uh, as planned. Uh, Emerald Cup is going to be a, uh, a separate event uh, on during that during that same weekend. It's unfortunate. Um, that the venue wasn't uh, accommodating in the beginning, but nonetheless, both events will still be going on live and direct. Isn't the alternative location in Vernon and it's a meat packing plant or something like that and it can only accommodate like 2,000 people? No, Susan, that is fake news. Is, aren't they going to be competing then, like pulling people from each other instead of bringing it all together? Maybe that was their point in the beginning, not them, but like the city. Maybe they'll be at different times. 
So yeah, just- if you want to go to both, you could go to both. <laughs> it's just a head spinner. I mean, this is insane. And it, it, for, more than anything, it's just unfortunate because this was going to be sort of like this really beautiful coming together of the NorCal culture, outdoor culture, and, you know, and these folks down here in L.A. So th- it's just unfortunate. But the thing that blows my mind is is this venue issue because it wasn't this like, um, Brandon, like an AB 2020 event where you – they were – permit had to be secured on a state and local level and that should have been nailed down a long time ago it seemed the saturday event as it was marketed definitely seemed to be the type of event where you would need a state and local um permit to pull it off the friday event as i understand it is happening at their private campus um it's a limited event um they already you know allow consumption within their building uh, and I don't believe they needed a, a permit to have have that event, but I could be wrong. They should just move it up to their rooftop. The rooftop even open? <laughs> I don't the know. rooftop is almost complete. It's almost complete. I was just up there yesterday. How many levels is that building? It's pretty big, right? Like, what is it, 70,000 square feet Seven, or something? 70,000 square feet. It's seven levels with a rooftop and a basement, so I count that as nine levels. Let, this is this is going to be a continuing story, so let's keep smoking the news. Well, all right. Coming up next, we have Roz McCarthy. Roz McCarthy is a Florida-based entrepreneur in the cannabis space. Oh, my God, where did it go? Where'd you go, Roz? Oh, there you are. Sorry. She and her Florida-based entrepreneurial leading the charge in the ultimate, canna brand, called, ultimate cannabis lifestyle brand, Black Buddha Cannabis, also the founder and CEO of Minorities for Medical Marijuana, coming to the stage. What do you have for us, Roz? Hey, Jason. Thanks for having me. Um, good morning, everyone. Roz McCarthy here. Uh, my story comes from Cannabis Now, um, and it's entitled, Is Determining a Standard Marijuana Dosing Unit Possible? Is there a basic marijuana dose? Maybe, but so many exceptions apply that the answer may never be satisfied. So often misunderstood or vilified when it's not prohibited, marijuana has long suffered from a lack of concrete knowledge. One metric that experts agree is holding cannabis back is an agreed upon standardized marijuana unit. Most everything else humans put in their bodies that governments regulate and tax can be easily measured, categorized, and divided a thousand calorie burger, a tropical, co- a tropical cocktail with the total alcohol equivalent of two drinks, movie theater popcorn with two servings of butter. But cannabis isn't this. A host of factors, including personal tolerance and methods of ingestion, as well as complications such as terpenes and secondary cannabinoids, complicate the effects of cannabis and defy easy standardization. If a five milligram edible hits two people differently and five milligrams of THC inhaled hits an entirely different way from the edible, what's the purpose of printing five milligrams on the label in the first place? You could be forgiven for declaring the whole exercise futile, except that's not how science or regulators work. Um, The rule of five says uh, this, So far, the best available standardized cannabis um, unit seems to be 5 milligrams of THC or about half of the 10 milligram dose that regulators in adult use states, including California and Colorado, have hit upon. Adult use edibles in those states are are limited to no more than 100 milligrams per package product and regulations require the 100 milligrams to be broken up into discrete units with the idea that such careful division will reduce instances of over-intoxication. Five milligrams of THC per marijuana unit is a standard first proposed in 2020 by researchers Tom Freeman and Valentina Lorenzetti, who published their reasoning in the journal Addiction, arguing that such a value reflects the quantity of primary active pharmacological constituents. With concentrates that isolate THC from other constituents, compounds such as secondary cannabinoids and terpenes, Edibles or pharmaceutical, or pharmaceutical grade cannabis products, including FDA approved sativic, the rule of five is prob- probably workable, cannabis in- industry insiders say. So there are some exceptions that apply. Um, of course, beyond method of ingestion, there are secondary cannabinoids, including CBD, as well as THCV and terpenes, all of which help 10 milligrams hit more quickly or more intensely than 20, a phenomenon he exper- experienced firsthand when trying out a new hemp-derived Delta-9 THB-based gummy. I think the accuracy of label is more important than the standard, says Ian Monat, 
the co-founder and CEO of Rhythm, which makes hemp-based CBD beverages. Monat says that the CBD products in particular are best with wildly inaccurate labels, and even a precise figure can become inaccurate over time as cannabinoids degrade, processes that are accelerated in the presence of compounds, including aluminum, like a beverage can. A can. So again, you know, this was an article based on understanding, can we measure? Should we measure? How do we measure? I would love to get you guys' thoughts. I'm Roz McCarthy, signing off from the State of Cannabis News Hour. What do you say? Thank you, Roz. I, you know, it's so funny. People complain about how weed is so much stronger these days than it used to be. And it's like, yeah, if you're smoking a joint, just take one puff. That's right. how you, you gotta smoke joint. You got to smoke joints all the way through. Once you fucking put a joint out, it should, should, should be done. Thank- you should never relight a joint. That should never. That's be- why I love dog walkers. Thank you. Sorry. Measure flour and puffs. One puff, two puff. <laughs> this is an amazing. Isn't that what? This story is great, Roz. Thank you for bringing it up because this is actually a really big issue for patients and people trying to figure out dosing, like from patients to the adult <laughs> use market. Actually, two point five milligrams is the actually like data point. That's the standard for average standard for psychoactivity for someone who's never used cannabis and it's definitely different with edibles as we know and other things so this really is actually an issue and i think unfortunately we have to go with like the lowest common denominator sometimes because i know there's people who need significantly larger doses i personally think the medical market will be able to have the higher doses like we've seen and the recreational market will have the lower doses but i think there's a lot more to say on this and i know we're short on time thank you yeah, yeah, I, think, I disagree. I think that this this standardization of this five milligram and ten milligram is going to ultimately be the standard, regardless of what you're trying to do, because that's what they've already done. They haven't made any type of distinction uh, for, for medical and allowing for stronger edibles. And I feel it's a very uh, disheartening on the patients, especially the ones that need those five hundred milligram edibles and thousand milligram edibles that always relied on them under our medical days. And now, because of legalization, they don't fucking have them, and it's fucking bullshit. Are you serious with 500 milligrams? 100 percent. Yeah, I have tons of patients that come in all the time that always want 500 milligrams, 1,000 milligram edibles, and they go through them no problem. Total functional, normal human but beings. Then Richard Lee. Them. Richard Lee. Then their kids get into them. I agree with you, Jason. I'm just saying I totally do. I'm just saying I think like it's unfortunate with so many things we have to operate from the lowest common denominator. It's fucking stupid. People need to fucking put their pants on and be fucking adults. Yeah, Richard Lee need, needs 500 milligrams, and uh, there are people that need that much. You're right. I didn't know. I just think, I I just thought that was a number that was like I you know pass intoxication, but I guess if that's what you need, that's what happens when you're in Florida, Roz, and you're not you know what I'm saying well, not, not, know, not knowing listen, the real deal, girl. I don't know the real deal. That's why I have to come to Cali. But I do think the medical market may have an opportunity. And that's why when you see some of these different dispensaries leaving the medical market, I don't think you should leave it because it's going to turn itself back around. And I do think they're going to be able to increase and you're going to have more options um, when the medical market, when things legalize on the medical side. Yeah. It's not even not even realistic. You guys are fucking pipe dreaming wishing right now. Let's let's let Brandon have the last word. Then we need to wrap the show. Well, I agree with Jason. We need to have those heavy doses available for the patients that need them. They have them available in Oklahoma. You know, they just set arbitrary caps and limits here and they say to, you know, protect children. But we have Everclear and things like that in alcohol. So have higher dosage products for the people that need them. And, you know, there are ways to make them unavailable to the children. Yeah, Everclear. Everclear. (laughs) Yeah, you know, and the regulators need these these numbers too. When I filed a motion to return my cannabis uh, because the cops stole it from me, uh, the judge said, "Well, you don't have uh, dosages and frequency of use on your recommendation, so I'm not going to let you have it back." Anyway, so that was a really great show, exciting. If you missed any of it, make sure to catch the replay or find us a few hours after the show anywhere you get your podcast podcasts or on our YouTube channel. And if you like the content, please subscribe and leave a review. A big thank you to all of the correspondents that comb through the headlines every day to bring us just what we need to know. A big thank you to Rico and Jason for co-producing the show and our pinup girl, Liz Rogan. Thank you, audience, for being our eyes and ears when there's news in your city, county, state, or country. Your addition to our show makes the State of Cannabis News Hour news you can trust. You 
have been tuned in to the State of Cannabis News Hour, where we collectively move policy forward in an inclusive and sustainable way. Start your morning on a high note and join us every weekday at 9 a.m. Pacific Time for the State of Cannabis News Hour, your daily dose. Say goodbye, Rico. Goodbye.